It's June 13th, 2014. We're in LA where the hometown Kings are battling the New York Rangers in game five of the Stanley Cup final. Tied at two, nearly 15 minutes into a second overtime, someone's got to score. A goal for LA would mean they're hoisting the cup. For the Rangers, they'd live to fight another day. But before we get to that, we should remember the absurd journeys both teams took to get here. The greatness of some guy called Hank, and how the Kings could claim their second cup in three years. We should rewind. If the Kings can get out of their defensive zone right here, they'll have a chance to not just end the final and hoist the cup, LA can finally just get some rest. They've played so much hockey. To reach the final, a team has to advance through three series. To take a series, they need to win four games. That means each series has a maximum of seven games played, and in 2014, the LA Kings played every goddamn game possible to reach the final three straight seven game series. Seven of those 21 games were win or go home, including four straight in the opening round after falling in a three nothing hole to the Sharks. We'll get into that Chicago series a bit later, but this run by the Kings, no team had ever reached the Stanley Cup final after maxing out each series. But that's what has made this Kings team fun over the last few years. They love doing unprecedented shit. Just two years ago, LA snuck into the playoffs with a late push for the eight seed, and went on a run where they downed the West's top three seeds on the way to the final. Once there, they did what no eight seed had ever done before. Also, what no Kings team had done in their first 44 seasons of existence. Two final runs in three years with a conference finals appearance in between, it's been a lot of hockey. But that also means experience. and. That team has only gotten better. After they won the cup in 2012, head coach Daryl Sutter immediately imagined what else that team was capable of because they had some very good and still young pieces. Jonathan Quick, the owner of 2012's Conn Smythe Trophy, dazzled in net for LA. After taking over as the Kings' top goaltender in 2008, Quick strung together three straight 35 plus win seasons. But maybe most importantly in 2014, he got some help. Thanks to backups Martin Jones and Ben Scrivens, Quick started his lowest percentage of games since that 08-09 season. He still played the majority, but that three-man approach gave up the fewest goals of any team in the league. The defensive pairs in front of the net share some of that credit. Drew Doughty continued to own his spot as one of the league's premier defensemen, and made it so LA's offense didn't really need to be otherworldly. When Sutter stepped in ahead of their cup run, he united all the parts that had seen their potential somewhat wasted under the previous regime. Known as a demanding coach capable of getting the most out of his players, if anyone can make sure the team doesn't get complacent after so many games played right now, it's Sutter. But while they're a goal away from winning the franchise's second cup, considering who is down at the other end of the ice, that's not the easiest task. Henrik Lundqvist is so good that I know I can't do him justice. So here's an anecdote instead. Lundqvist debuted with the Rangers on October 8th, 2005. On October 16th, he earned the nickname King Henrik. He has lived up to that moniker in the near decade since. 30 win season after 30 win season after 30 win season. That one outlier, a lockout shortened year where he led the league with 24 wins on a 48 game schedule. He's absurd. The fact that goaltenders need help from their offense to get those wins only makes it more wild. Since Hank took over, the Rangers have never finished top 10 in league scoring, yet only once in that same span have they missed the playoffs, which has further fed the mindset of so long as Lundqvist's in net, the Rangers have a shot. In order to secure the most meaningful piece of hardware for their goalie's otherwise loaded resume, New York made a much needed move. Elaine Vignon came in for the 2013-2014 season. After years of watching the more conservative John Tortorella, this season, Vignon's system felt incredibly up-tempo. Really, it just played into New York's strengths. 
The offense fed straight through their impressive defense, which would collapse and defend the net before looking to break out on a long pass. That's not to say there weren't growing pains as the team learned the system, but in the back half of the year, things really clicked into place. The Rangers caught fire. They found more consistency on offense and went on an absolute tear heading into the playoffs. During that run, New York made a headline-stealing deadline deal. The Rangers made sure they'd get something for Ryan Callahan, who looked set to part ways with New York in the offseason. Swapping captains with Tampa Bay, in came the legendary and diminutive Marty St. Louis. Approaching 40, St. Louis averaged nearly a point per game with Tampa before the trade, but finishing the regular season in New York saw less than encouraging results. For a team that could always use some extra offense, it looked concerning heading into the playoffs. However, once the games meant more, the winger showed up. Five points in the Rangers' first three playoff games, including what would be the game winner in game three against Philadelphia. New York needed every point possible as each series became a battle. They alternated games with Philly for a full seven, fell behind three games to one against Pittsburgh before Lundqvist gave up just a single goal in each of the final three games to win another series in seven, then finished off Montreal in six, capping off the conference finals with a shutout. New York became the first team to reach the final after opening the playoffs with back-to-back seven-game series, a feat that the Kings immediately won-upped. So, as Lundqvist watches from the other end of the ice, a Rangers goal here would be huge as New York tries to climb out of a 3-1 series deficit for the second time this postseason. That honestly wouldn't be a shock. The fact we're still tied up after nearly 95 minutes is fitting for how tight this entire final has been. At the start of this postseason, my coworker John, who you might know, summed up overtime playoff hockey perfectly. That has rang especially true for the Kings and Rangers. Tonight marks the fifth period of overtime these teams have played in five games. The Kings' 3-1 series lead could just as easily belong to the Rangers instead. In Game 1, the Rangers scored first thanks to an unassisted breakaway by Benoit Pouliot. Less than two minutes later, Carl Hagelin doubled that lead while shorthanded. Spotting Lundqvist two goals against the team that scored the fewest regular season goals of anyone in the playoffs seemed pretty promising. But from there, the Rangers' score sheet never changed. Quick and the Kings D smothered New York as they'd done to everyone all season. LA managed to cut their deficit in half before the first period ended, then in the second, Dowdy scored his fifth of the postseason to tie things up. Both goalies returned to their stonewall form from there. With neither side letting anything in, we got our first overtime and it came down to who would make the first mistake. In a moment dripping with routine, career ranger, veteran defenseman Dan Girardi fanned on a pass from his own end. Three kings were the closest to the puck, Mike Richards fed Justin Williams, and with little room to react, Lindquist looking to the heavens says it all. Game two saw more offense, but a similar story. New York grabbed a two goal lead in the first. The Kings scored a pair in the second, but each time the Rangers answered. Again, the Kings cut their deficit to one, and then again LA capitalized on a brief moment of misfortune for New York's defense. Former Ranger Marion Gabrick tied it up with his 13th goal of the playoffs. New York had a beautiful chance to retake the lead, but even Quick was likely smiling behind his mask following this one. After trading punches through three periods, both sides struggled to land anything in overtime number one. The Rangers nearly capitalized on the power play with this incredible breakout. Chris Kreider sprinted in, only to go wide with the shot, then wider with his body. Once again, both goalies returned to their familiar ways. Once again, Lundqvist cracked first. Willie Mitchell threw a shot towards the goal where Dustin Brown waited, got his stick on the puck, and passed Lundqvist, who this time said a bit more with his reaction. Either game, or both games, could just as easily have gone New York's way and drastically changed this series. LA never even played with the lead in games one or two. And to make the what-if worse for the Rangers, they converted just one of 18 power plays in the first four games of the series. The Kings cruised in game three behind a shutout by Quick, then New York finally managed to not blow a two-goal lead once facing elimination. 
That four game grind set up tonight where the Rangers would have to do something they hadn't done all series, make a comeback. Late in the second, they answered LA's goal, finally converting again on the power play. Then, just as shockingly with 30 seconds in the period, New York got their second shorty of the series to take the lead. But like games one and two, the Kings found a way to tie things up and push tonight into overtime. Five minutes in, the Rangers nearly changed their luck. Ryan McDonough even thought he had, but the post made his celebration premature. Eight minutes later, the universe evened the karmic balance as the Rangers crossbar sang. Pitching, they keep it in, they shot off the crossbar, one at each end. The offense is forced Quick and Lundqvist to sell out constantly, but an extra 20 couldn't settle this. Overtime number two saw some tired legs make frantic plays. The Rangers again could only kiss the post, or when faced with a wide open net, have their moments spoiled by LA's active defense. Both defenses, and the goaltenders in particular, stepped up throughout overtime. Like the entire series, either team could have ended this already. But here we are. LA with a chance to win the cup, the Rangers looking to force a game six in New York. With both sides needing late game heroics, each team actually has a few guys on the ice who have already played the hero this postseason. Down in the corner, New York's Poliot had what ended up being the series winner against Philly. His linemate Derek Broussard netted a pair of game winners against Pittsburgh, the first of which came in overtime. For the Kings, Trevor Lewis and Tyler Toffoli have combined for three game winners, but none with the stakes too high. The one guy on the ice who has delivered in a similar situation this postseason is LA's Alec Martinez. Martinez is a career king. Drafted in 2007's fourth round, the defenseman became a more permanent part of LA's roster in the 2010-11 season. But with defense being the Kings' strong suit, securing a spot hasn't always been easy. Offensively, Martinez offered something that other LA defensemen didn't, which certainly helped, but that also meant when he went through a drought and took a step back defensively during a contract year, his spot was far from guaranteed. As the 2013-14 season progressed, Martinez managed to get comfortable again, even turned in a career year where he led Kings defensemen in goals. He became the more trusted part of LA's third pair heading into the postseason, and thankfully for the Kings, already had a career-defining moment in the playoffs. I told you we'd get back to LA's Game 7 against Chicago. Tell me if you've heard this one before. The Kings found themselves down 2-0 to start the game, clawed part of the way back, and then needed Gabrick to force overtime in the third. With the next goal sending either team to the final, the puck found Martinez near the blue line. With questionable form, Martinez threw a lazy wrister towards the net, but the puck somehow took this little hop off Nick Letty's hip and over Corey Crawford for the Game 7 overtime winner. That's what got the Kings here. If LA can take control of the puck, every shot attempt has the chance to bring them their second cup in three years. Their road has been anything but straightforward. They've overcome the odds with absurd regularity, in large part thanks to their man between the pipes. If the Rangers can get another shot past them, they'll not only live to see game six, but potentially steal the momentum of a series that could easily be in their control. If they can retake this series, it could be the final feather in the already feather-filled cap of one of the most impressive goaltenders we've ever seen. With the Stanley Cup on the line, welcome to a moment in history. Pouliot to Broussard, centering. Green is there against Zuccarello to knock the puck away. Alec Martinez will lead the rush to center. To Kyle Clifford, to Foley, he shoots, breaks a rebound. They score! The Los Angeles Kings have won the Stanley Cup. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm gonna recommend an old one that I honestly forgot about until now. Sean Avery's Beef with Brodeur. Hope you enjoy that, or we've got plenty others to kill some time too. Subscribe to Secret Base, and we'll see you soon.